In this series of seminars, we focused on some key areas in which Australian women have changed and continue to change. We've looked at the evolving relationship of young women to feminism within Australian culture. We've looked at the ways in which education can shape and influence the direction of women's lives. We've looked at some of the great diversity of expectations and definitions of what it means to mother in the 1990s. We've canvassed some of the broader impacts of social change on women's lives in rural and regional areas. We've looked at women's increased and particular contributions to the performing arts and the ways in which some of their performances have actually helped us rethink conventional images of women. And finally, we took a challenging look at some of the richness and diversity to be found in older women's lives. I was really intrigued when I noticed during some conversations with my friends that what we were saying were really basic feminist arguments. I suggested this and was nearly totally annihilated. Um, everyone was terribly insulted that I was branding their good, good reputations with the idea of a, a feminist, God forbid. Um, I was really fascinated with that idea, so I switched topics to try and discover the attitudes of young people towards feminism, focusing on those aged from about 15 to 19 years old. To begin with, I was very secretive. I wasn't going to let anyone think I was a feminist. So I began to subtly change the topics of conversations to include some recent sexist, a sexist act, let the other members comment on it, and then say thoughtfully, so, do you think you're a feminist? The usual answer was an immediate, no! And so I'd go, oh, well, do you believe in like equal rights for women? <laughs> well, of course, they'd say, <laughs> he doesn't. So I'd say, but you're not a feminist. And then they'd stop and think for a minute. Well, what exactly do you mean by a feminist? Well, after about a million of these responses, um, I realised that there was a definite pattern forming, and so I began to look at myself. I was not at all comfortable be being identified as a feminist, but I openly advocated for the equality of the sexes, and I realised that no one had ever called me a feminist before, except once or twice, and that had the stigma attached of a derogatory remark. We know feminism is a highly contested term and we know it's systematically misused. I often refer to the definition of feminism by the American historian Nancy Cott, who says it's a flexible doctrine which has taken different forms at particular historical moments. One can acknowledge that what is feminist in one period may not be or may be differently so in another. In other words, Feminism, like any other movement, is a product of a particular time and place. It seems to me that this sort of understanding is missing from the critique of our feminism by some of the established feminists. The criticism of us as inarticulate, prudish and priggish, in fact, is quite reminiscent of Anne Summers' criticism of late 19th century feminists as moderate and puritanical reformers in her popular book, damned whores and God's police. I think it has to be said, and I, I'm not, I don't think it's been said tonight, but our feminism is different because it's born of an era in which there is intense competition for jobs among young people and in which the, the whole spectre of AIDS has put a damper on the ideology of sexual libertarianism. The whole dominance of economic rationalism has hampered the activity and visibility of movements like feminism, like unionism. But I think to abandon the word feminist, as some people have suggested, in favour of words like equalist, would be to short circuit a long history of feminism that is dynamic, that is changing. I've always um, worked from the definition of feminists, and perhaps this comes back again to some of the things Cassandra related to us earlier. Feminists, um, according to the UK philosopher and feminist Janet Radcliffe Richards, are those who believe women suffer systematic social injustice because of their sex and that something must be done about it. Again, I don't think it's been said tonight that 
this whole notion of reluctance to call yourself a, feminism, a feminist is not really tested. We don't have any concrete evidence to suggest that young women are uneasy with the term or that we live in an era of post-feminism as many people still like to proclaim. In fact, we know the feminist spirit is alive in many young women and you only have to look at the increasing numbers of young women moving into education and into the professions and demographic changes like the later age at marriage. These are all important changes, I think, that shows that that feminist spirit is being carried on. Stop me before I start going all limp, lame, totally insane. Madonna's not a hers bean. Madonna's not some make it quick, rich, quick, wham, ham, blonde airhead who has no shame. Yeah, okay, I can hear my aunt's disgust. I can feel their disapproval as I look beneath my curly hair. How could anyone, especially you, girl, black girl, dance with Madonna? My heart's confused, my spirit's crying. I want Madonna back the way she was. Stop me, now I'll always keep space for Madonna in my sweet black heart. We thought it was really important to have a question mark at the end of the title of the seminar because we wanted to stress that education wasn't synonymous with degrees. There are lots of ways of becoming educated, informal and formal. And obviously schools, universities immediately capture our imagination in, in terms of education. But there are lots of informal networks, community, neighbourhood houses. But importantly for us too are the relationships women build with other women that help educate them uh, in terms of possibilities for change, possibilities for, for new visions of who they are as women. Uh, mothers and daughters, sisters, friends, colleagues, people who provide informal recognition of the skills that women already have and give them the encouragement to create new possibilities and new visions. Um, I guess I wanted to leave school at high school and my mother played a bit of a trick on me. She did two things that were very significant actually at high school in terms of my feeling about education and its worth. One is that, you know, I was sort of really uh, anti-authority in my secondary school days, very, very compliant in my primary school days. And I said that I wanted to leave school, I was bored, I didn't like the teachers, I didn't want to do maths too, etc, etc, etc. And the German teacher was a rotten, rude old man, I mean, you know, on and on and on. Meanwhile, the wisdom of the counsellors who came round, I went to school in Queensland, um, the counsellors came round and told all of us girls who were ACKers, the ones who hadn't learnt typing, naughty, 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 we hadn't learned typing. Actually, I must say, I wish I had learned typing. But not in a way that deprived me of being able to learn sciences and languages, which is what happened to us. You're either an, acca, an academic kid and you're over there, or you're a commercial girl and you're over there, or you're an industrial boy and you're set fire to the classrooms most days and you're up there. Um, and so it went on. So the counsellor told all us girls that we could be mums or teachers. Didn't even mention nurses, fancy that didn't say to me I could be a nurse and I'd wanted actually to be a vet but my uncle who lived on a station out in Western Queensland said to my mother Chrissy you can't have her being a vet you know the only way to make a quid when you're a vet is to have your arm up the back of a heifer I mean I can't really talk to you about it I mean she'll be out there delivering car I mean look it's unspeakable Chrissy you can't have her being a vet so it became unspeakable and somehow the idea of being a vet faded out of view I had no good advice as to what I should become and I think this is vital and I think things have changed radically over the last 25 years, but not radically enough. I could have been an engineer, I really fancy the idea actually, or I could have been a scientist or a lawyer, but I had no one to really talk to me about these things and I had no one in my whole extended family, which was massive in Queensland from the, you know, um, the, the cockies who told me I shouldn't be a vet to all sorts of people who ran um, family businesses and I had no role model at all. What I want to speak about today is the whole issue of access to education, access for students from, and particularly girls from low socioeconomic groups as opposed to working class group. I mean, it's, it's not quite accurate to say students from working class backgrounds because often no one in the family has had experience with work and sometimes there's been generations of not experiencing work. Um, and within that, to also talk about access to education for Koori women and Kurris in particular. Now, 
Whilst many of you may recognise me from the battle to reopen North Lane Secondary College, which was a truly epic battle and it did wear us out over two and a quarter years, my commitment to ensuring students from all backgrounds, and particularly women, get access to education was not something that blossomed overnight once the school was closed. In fact, I've spent all my working life attempting to find ways to make formal education really accessible, relevant, democratic, so that it really involves the students, culturally inclusive, so people from all backgrounds actually have access to it and feel part of it, and a means of empowering people, so people can take charge of their lives, and particularly women. The other reason I fought so hard for women to really get access to education is that I so very nearly didn't. My mother was told by her own sisters right, and her own family that really I shouldn't go on to university, I shouldn't go on to an education. The teachers were all telling her how wonderfully well I was doing and that I should go on to further study and by that time because of a really wonderful teacher I decided that I really wanted to be a teacher, right, and that it was my dream to really go out there and do something and change the world, sort of this mission mentality, yes, missionary mentality. But she had a whole family telling her. I remember the argument. I could hear it from upstairs where my mother was standing up to her own family saying, no, Rafael is going to go on to university. And it doesn't matter that she might get married and have kids and never use it again. It just doesn't matter. And it's very interesting because I ended up paving the way for my cousins. This is my, my own aunt, the one who was arguing against. She ended up sending her children, of course, all to university. And it really paved the way for all of them. And they went on to become accountants or to go into, uh, one did go into teaching and he was a male, not the female, right? One went into banking and they've all gone into various different spheres. And my own sister, my own half-sister, is actually in engineering. So I think there's some, some lessons we learnt there. An increasing number of Australian women are combining the demands of paid employment with the roles and responsibilities of raising children. Traditional notions of motherhood have suggested that it is women's primary responsibility to raise and bear children. Um, however, these ideas are changing. And arguably, it is feminism itself that has played an enormous part in bringing about this change. For an earlier generation of feminists, the category of motherhood itself was problematic, with women's domestic responsibilities being seen as the primary reason for their inability to participate fully in public life. However, contemporary feminists seek to revise this position and seek to provide a view of women's lives which enables uh, the maximisation of choice. Um, Likewise, contemporary feminists challenge society to accommodate a multiplicity of roles and identities for women, including mothers. Like many feminists of my generation, I had abandoned my own mother as a role model. I was proud of the fact that I had thrown off what I'd seen as my subservient shackles and had had the ability to make my own decisions. I was the first woman from my family to attend university. I had travelled, I had a professional job, I was politically active and I had embarked on postgraduate qualifications. All my life I had made my own decisions. Choosing to have a baby was indeed one of them as a supposed single parent. Yet at the, as the time of my baby's birth drew near, I was suddenly terrified. Who on earth was I going to be now? <clears throat> For some reason I had a mental block about life after maternity leave. I had saved up my recreation leave dutifully during my job. I had enough money to be off work for at least eight months. Yet for some reason I never really seemed to be able to envisage life after I went back to work. As someone pointed out to me just before he was born, you know, babies don't actually go out for coffee. They don't <laughs> visit their friends and they don't go to work. They are there for some time. <laughs> Clearly I knew nothing about children and I'm not sure when I realised just how wrong I really was. But suddenly some type of reality did hit and at seven and a half months some of you may have seen me in the age bemoaning how difficult it was to get childcare. I have to admit I had only just commenced my search. I was madly dashing around trying to organise childcare which I know you will all agree is a very long, exhausting and very frustrating task. <clears throat> so what happened to me because I was 
you know, supposedly an intelligent woman. I believe that I was in fact seduced by the romance of getting pregnant. <clears throat> I wanted to have a baby. I just wasn't sure about taking care of one for the next 20 years. I knew that I didn't want to be my own mother. I didn't want to be, come, become my mother, yet I had not worked out what kind of mother I would in fact be. This, I believe, is a journey of many steps. Now, again, I want to quote Diane Richardson here. She said, paid employment may eliminate or reduce what is for many women the worst aspect of motherhood, that is social isolation and loneliness. It may also help women to recover or maintain a sense of autonomy and identity beyond that of being just a mother. However, it is also true that combining work with mothering can lead to conflicts and stresses, particularly if something happens to the children at the time the mother is at work, or when the mother finds her work, both domestic and paid employment, are overwhelming. My point here is that Women should not have to see being a mother and having a job as alternatives. Women should also not have to feel guilty of leaving children in child minding centers in order to be able to go out to work or to do other things to fulfill their needs. This, in my view, is the central point of motherhood and feminism today. Now, because of the time limit I have, I now should like to discuss motherhood and feminism in the context of migrant motherhood. The situation of a person who is a mother as well as an immigrant is more complex. Many women talk about unable to follow the traditional custom when they have a baby in Australia because of the different system of belief and practices surrounding childbirth. Others talk about the need to follow the instruction of health care providers about birth, confinement and caring for their newborn. This is partly because they are now living in a new society. It's also because they fear offending the authority of Australian health care providers. This results in distress for many women. The voices of rural women have often been absent from discussions of the impact of feminism on women's lives. But just like women in Australian cities, the lives of rural women have been shaped by enormous political, social and economic changes. And they themselves come from a range of ethnic and, and cultural backgrounds. Rural women have had to respond to changing demands placed upon them by families, by new agricultural practices, by business and civic duties, and by the communities in which they belong. And they themselves have been active agents of change. My great-grandmother Violet had a husband and three daughters. They lived on two 640-acre blocks, and her day began at 4.30 in the morning. When the horses were being used in the paddock, they were fed and yoked up at sunrise by the men, so the women got up. By the time the kids were called to get up at around seven, she'd given her husband breakfast and be sitting in the kitchen beside an old kerosene lamp knitting socks. After she'd given the kids their breakfast and sent them off to school, her chores started. So the roles my great-grandmother played were dominated by family commitments including childminding, housekeeping, yard work, jobs up the paddock helping her husband, such as shifting sheep and hay carting. Her participation in property management was minimal, with her husband making the majority of the decisions. Little voluntary work was done by this generation. However, many women, including my great-grandmother, were CWA members. They did handiwork for local charities and much more during the war effort. There was little emphasis on education and very few people were schooled beyond lower secondary school. It was, however, the woman's role to tutor the children in their homework or to teach them if they learnt by correspondence. Many of these roles changed dramatically during the next generation, the third generation. When compared to her mother, Zell participated in far more fundraising organisations. Other than CWA, these included the Guild, the school, the tennis club and the local Goshen Hall. Finally, there were more financial resources available on the farm than the previous generation. During the 50s and 60s, favourable seasons and good prices enabled people to repay the debts left from the Depression. As described by my grandmother, things were good, no financial worries at all, but we worked very hard and Doug was very careful. 
Fewer diversifications, such as turkeys, pigs and so on, were necessary to keep financially afloat. Zell describes being able to afford an old second-hand ute to drive to her community commitments. Unlike the previous generation, women now learnt how to drive cars. My mother's roles have increased dramatically. Not only has her role increased on the farm, but it's increased dramatically off the farm. It seems that her primary role is still within the family and the farm enterprise, and any other role she assumes seems secondary. For example, during cropping, she goes to work in town, then comes home and prepares the evening meals, takes it to my father up the paddock, then comes home and may have to organise the monthly accounts. Both primary and secondary roles have expanded during the current rural recession. Primary roles include parenthood, the household, outside up the paddock, and the ever-growing farm enterprise, including marketing grains, organising contracting work, budgeting, administration, and liaisons with bank managers, accountants, lawyers, and the list goes on. With many increases in the roles my mother plays, all being critically important, her stress levels are often high. Like many rural women in the 90s, this may lead to major health problems if left unaddressed. The most important luxury for Elwyn is time. Time to do what she wants to do for herself. I come from a small village in, uh, in Italy, south of Italy, and it's called Natile. And Natile was um, quite a quaint little village, um, a small population. And, uh, and also self-contained, which it was quite great because a lot of them had animals that they could uh, master and they all had different, different type of um, hobbies. And of course the women played a big role there too. In 1951, we had floods because the village was washed away. A lot of uh, human life was lost. And that opened doors for younger people to migrate to different countries. My father migrated to Australia with oh, probably a dozen of his mates, and he only came here for what, what he said to us, three years. And then he was going to come back home. And when we migrated then, it was quite interesting, because we left Italy on the 4th of February, and that course was in the middle of snow. It was two feet of snow in front of our doorway when we left Italy. We arrived in Maltura on the 4th of March. Can you imagine? 40 degree heat. And my mother knew then that she's going to have a hard time. <laughs> 1954 wasn't a very easy time to migrate. I would go to school. I couldn't understand the teacher. The teacher couldn't understand me. And of course, when he used to come around, while the other people used to do their, probably their English, their social studies, I would do pretty drawings. He'd come around and he would, <clears throat> he wouldn't like that. I wasn't paying attention, but I didn't understand him. So he would sit me in front of the class. My knuckles was red raw and I was very sad. <clears throat> in fact, I thought it was very cruel. Also, too, when I used to go to have my lunch, you know that we didn't have sliced bread. We made our own homemade bread. We made our own sausages, our cheese. And I used to say to my mother, please cut my bread finely. Don't make such thick pieces. Cut my salami very thin and my cheese. So when we used to go out to lunch, the boys, in the meantime, would go into my area there where I had my um, lunchbox. They would pick out the salami and the cheese and whatever. And they'd fill up my sandwiches with earthworms. <laughs> Can you imagine that? And I couldn't express myself. I couldn't cry. So what, what I did is really, what I could do well is cry. The young girls that were with me, um, they said, they looked at me, as I said before, we cried together. What they used to do is they would share, me, share with me their lunch. I took a, a look at one of the sandwiches that they were giving me and I looked at it and I thought, oh no, which is worse? 
the earthworms, <laughs> or the Vegemite. <laughs> it, it didn't look appetising at all. And, but I, I had, I really did give it a go. I had a bite of a Vegemite sandwich. I must admit, I still don't like it. <laughs> but they were fighting over my sandwiches each time I went to school. Unfortunately, I didn't continue going to school for very long, much to my parents' disappointment because that was their, 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 their communication line. They were actually depending on me and my other sisters to learn English so then we could fit in with the community. The performing arts offer women a chance to play up and make a scene in public. Increasing numbers of women are using stage, radio, screen, dance and other modes of creative expression to challenge traditional notions of femininity and to explore new ways of being female. Women performers often make exciting connections between social reality and their art form in their own work practices. They may use and transform traditional genres of performance, such as circus or classical dance, in order to represent and reflect their experience as contemporary women. In these ways, performance is not only a mode of creative expression, but is a means of communicating ideas and promoting social change. Involvement in the performing arts offers women an opportunity to imaginatively represent the diversity of women's lives. The Women's Circus has a mission. It is to provide opportunities for women from all backgrounds to acquire physical and technical skills whilst working in a safe, non-competitive and supportive environment. It is also to present feminism to a wider community through dynamic, high-quality circus physical theatre performances and workshops. The circus is based at and is a project of Footscray Community Arts Centre. The primary aim of the centre is to address issues of social justice through the work produced and the processes used to create art. The Women's Circus is an example of this work. There are now over 100 women involved in the circus and another 100 waiting to join. Whilst the circus has grown and developed over the last five years, the original aims are still central to the culture and work that is the Women's Circus. The circus aims are to reaffirm women's control over their bodies, to build self-esteem through physical and performance work, to allow women to set their own personal goals for development, to create a safe, non-competitive environment for women to work in, to enable women of different ages, abilities, shapes and sizes to come together to create a theatrical event. I wish I could just come here and dance for you. <laughs> it's, it's far easier for a performer, whether woman or man, I think, to perform than to talk about herself and her relationship to the gender that she, well, in my case, her relationship to the gender and the art form. For me, as I was trying to put this together yesterday, and I thought to myself, gee, it's very difficult to separate the two, um, which do I put first, my feminist kind of attitudes or, or you know, the kind of things I feel so very strongly because I'm a woman or because of I'm being an artist? Then after some time, I just gave up. And I thought I'd just share some experiences with you and you can decide which is more important. So if I do something as Tara, now, it's so connected with the performing I have done over so many decades that it's inseparable. It might be women's issues. In my case, as a trans migrant dancer, um, the issues are confused. I'm, I mean, there is a fight all the time 
for all the things you want to do. I'm not saying that it, it, at some stage that fight becomes a pleasure. And in the end, I decided I'll start to this. I mean, I've already started. I've said other things. But I thought I'll really start the speech by saying, it's a pleasure being a woman. And say, it's a pleasure being a woman performer. Um, it's true. I've had a tremendous amount of pleasure performing. And I'm very intensely involved with what I do. I uh, fervently believe in what I do. And the way I do it, the way it is, is because I'm a woman. And it's inseparable. <laughs> intended when we began to reach out into the community and provide a platform for lots of different sorts of women. We had no unitary sense of what women meant. We thought that there were groups out there of different races, different classes, different ages, all of whom could use a platform to speak to each other from. And that's the way it turned out. And in terms of this particular session, Growing Old Disgracefully, we were very aware that older women in our society we're a very large group demographically, but not a large group in terms of making their voices heard. We chose the title Growing Old Disgracefully with an eye to a poem, which we vaguely remembered, about when I grow old, I will wear purple and red and do terrible things like dance in the streets. Because it was clear that there are new freedoms for women when they get older, if they can learn to get rid of their responsibilities and, and move into new forms of creativity. And it's also clear that older women have wisdom, which is not always being imparted and not listened to. And we hope that we will provide a platform for people to give that back as well. I hope I can impart some wisdom. I don't know whether I'm qualified or not. I mightn't be old enough. <laughs> but yes, uh, I think that growing old is a beautiful thing. And the people that we have got out at our caring place, our elders, they. I say, are in their dream time now because they are elder, elder people. And the world has passed them by. They have been in institutions and things like that where they were completely forgotten. But we had a vision, and I had a vision, and with the help of the Aboriginal community, we knew that this vision could come to fruition. The vision was to take people like our elders out of institutions and bring them into a home environment like we always had. You now there's love and care, loving, caring and all and sharing. That was our environment when I was a young girl. And I think it still gathers momentum even now today with people like myself and Elder talking and trying to let other people understand what our aim is in life. Old people can get a, give a lot. They can give a lot. Even when a young man comes up or a young girl or boy comes up and asks you, what was it like? You can tell them. Because then they learn to understand what it was like in those days. Today now, the young people are looking for leadership. And I believe everyone in this room that has that thing to do can give leadership to anybody. You must all have grandchildren, nieces, nephews and everyone. You are not old people that are useless in this world. You are a people that are making headway to the younger generation because they are the leaders of the future when we go. And I think that is the thing that we all have to look at. Never mind where the aunt is that old that she can't move over the chair. Hang on to her hand and give her a smile. You see the sparkle in her eyes. And that's the way it is, and that's the way it should be with humanity. I'm wearing a hat on purpose today because when I was a young woman, my mother always wore a hat, and if she didn't, she was disgraceful. <laughs> and I just think it's interesting that I think, without, I haven't got my glasses on, I think I'm the only woman wearing a hat here today. So am I being disgraceful? So it's, it's just really interesting to see how we change. We were having a lovely laughing moment, a few of us there, at the tea bar. I don't know how many women. Hands up, women who've worn corsets. Come on, hands up, all of you lot who've worn corsets in your life. Not today. 
Okay. That's right. Pink satin things with suspenders. And wonder if we wore them today. Right. Maybe, and that's what we need to watch. Look what I'm doing, I'm wearing a hat. Here I am, an older woman, modelling, but it's all right to wear a hat, that's safe. Now, I'm certainly not modelling that we go back to corsets, but I bet you it won't be too far down the line. Look what Madonna did. So we sort of, we need to recognise that history repeats itself. God forbid we go back to those things. Oh. Hands up those who wore grey lyle stockings, suspended. How many people wear suspenders today? They've come back, haven't they, with younger women? They see it as smart, as sexy, as erotic to have suspenders. I'm talking... <laughs> so I think that what constitutes disgraceful is something that's a very social construction. So for me, disgracefulness was being pretty modest and pretty private, and I'm now feeling okay to take off my hat, thank you, because <laughs> I've arrived and I'm in your house. Um, I think that the issues that, in most cultures, older women are predicted to be responsible towards younger members of the family, as Jean was outlining well, towards grandchildren, towards their spouse, and there are more women that are spoused than a non-spoused in our community. I still hear women in their 70s, 60s, 70s mostly, in their 80s, who refer to their widowhood status of 25, 50 years, and they refer to themselves as widows. So they identify their current status as their widowhood status. And there are variations in this by culture. But older women, and Marion identified it, post-menopause, our procreative abilities have ceased. We are matrons, even if we aren't spoused. We can enjoy kissing, cuddling, touching, and we can be sensually romantic. We predict an asexuality for ourselves and an asexual sensuality for ourselves, which is very nice and proper when we're older. <coughs> We conspire with younger people to safeguard our predictions because most of us like to have affirmation of our beliefs. We are grannied. We granny ourselves. And we granny ourselves as women and we reinforce the stereotypes that are held around women as older. And I think this goes across many cultures. In a story set in the 1950s, the Canadian novelist Alice Munro wrote, rather inspiringly I think, there's a change coming in the lives of girls and women. All we've had up until now has been our connection with men. When Munro wrote that, the feminist movement was largely concerned with issues such as equal pay, equal job and education opportunity, birth control, basically with the woman's right to determine the course of her own life. Second wave feminism has fundamentally challenged the notion that a woman's identity is to be defined solely in terms of her relationship to a man, whether that be as wife, mother, daughter. And as such, I think it's really radically transformed the ways in which girls and women can now participate in the world. Mm -hmm.